morning and uh, welcome to the 22nd meeting in 2012 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. And can I just remind all those present to please turn off any mobile phones, pagers, uh, blackberries, etc. And we have received apologies today from Gavin Brown. I welcome to the meeting uh, Dave Thompson, who is substituting for Paul Wheelhouse today, and I therefore invite Dave Thompson to declare any interests relevant to the remit of the committee. Uh, nothing to declare, convener, other than what's already on the parliamentary system. Uh, thank you. Um, I now move to agenda item one, and the first item is to decide whether to take item four in private. Mm -hmm. Are members agreed? agreed? Members have indicated their agreement. So, uh, on, under agenda item two, we turn now to our stage one scrutiny of the Freedom of Information Amendment Scotland Bill, and we will uh, first of all take evidence um, from uh, Carol Ewart from the Campaign for Freedom of Information Scotland and David Sillers from the Commission for Ethical Standards and Public Life. And this will be the first of three evidence sessions this morning uh, on this uh, bill. I understand there are no opening statements and that therefore you will be uh, available for questions uh, uh, directly. So I'm just wondering if I can, uh, I'll ask each of you a question and then we can open things out to the, the rest of the of the committee if, if, if that's okay. Um, and the first one is to, to yourself, Ms. Ewart. I mean, I, I, understand, I note from your um, very detailed submission, which is actually one of the most detailed submissions we've actually had, uh, you, uh, your concerns with regard to the bill. I do have some concerns about your submission because it talks about more or less what should be in the bill rather than what is, is in the bill. And obviously we're here to take evidence on the bill itself. Uh, but you, you, in, in particular, you have concerns about um, the bill being extended to cover uh, other areas. Um, but of course, uh, the purpose of the bill states that it's to amend provisions of the Free of Information Act relating to effective various exemptions, the time limit for certain proceedings. And um, we, we received a letter from Brian Adam who said that the Freedom of Information Act 2002 already contains order making powers to extend coverage to bodies who appear to the Scottish Ministers to exercise functions of a public nature or are providing under a contract made with a Scottish public authority any services provision is a function of that authority. And I understand that Scottish Ministers, and we will be certainly asking questions on that point uh, um, to the Cabinet Secretary, uh, do intend to um, extend uh, coverage once these uh, the, the, the problems with the current bill um, are ironed out. So what is your view on the on the specifics uh, of the bill, um, because um, the, the Scottish Government have said that they will adjust the regime and it's necessary and sensible to do so. And of course, as I said, we'll ask questions on that. But on the bill itself, um, what do you feel about, for example, um, the, the royal exemption, which is uh, which has been an issue which has been raised by a number of people? What is the view of your organisation with regard to that, for example? Okay. Um, first of all, I can say that we're quite underwhelmed by the bill. Um, we have chosen to focus our submission on what should have been in the bill and it was reasonable to expect that there would be a broader view of reform of freedom of information in Scotland. Um, we're now 10 years after the, le the legislation was first passed. There have been numerous consultations um, and it's interesting to note that what has not been consulted upon is actually in the bill, such as uh, the exemption on royal correspondence. Um, we're also very conscious that the public supports reform um, of freedom of information legislation um, and the Scottish Government's six principles um, also back up the environment and the framework for which that more detailed reform um, should take place. Can I just also kind of emphasise the whole history of um, consultation, which is also part of the stage one process, um, because I think it is important just to revisit that. At the stage three debate in April 2002, the then uh, Justice Minister Jim Wallace promised consultation. He said that the consultation would begin very quickly after the bill had been passed. It did not need to await the appointment of the first uh, Scottish Information Commissioner. Um, we then had a Scottish Executive consultation in 2006, but the then Scottish Executive declined to introduce reform in 2007. We've then had a discussion paper issued in November 2008 and a consultation in 2010. And at each step of this process, there has been broad support, uh, even from bodies that might be covered, such as Glasgow Life, to the benefits of being covered by uh, FOISA. But yet, in this bill, we don't see reform. 
which brings me back to your specific question. Um, and we are now forming the view that Section 5 of the Freedom of Information Scotland Act is therefore not f fit for purpose, because Section 5, despite promises in 2002, has not been used. And even the consultation that's set out within Section 5 is imbalanced, because the consultation is on those bodies who may be covered, not on seeking the views of people who may wish to exercise their Section 1 rights. So we're uh, seriously of the view we might look uh, to be arguing for a deletion of Section 5 and an amendment to Section 4. On the specifics of um, royal correspondence, we're hugely disappointed that the Scottish Parliament, wh which has full capacity, this is a, is a devolved matter, you can do exactly what you wish to do, um, has decided to copy uh, an amendment to UK legislation you are therefore creating an inconsistency with the environmental information regulations. We do not think that the public interest um, defence has already exists, has been abused in any way in terms of decisions. In fact, it's very rare for a decision for disclosure. Um, we would suggest that you look at two recent decisions of the UK Information Commissioner, which may um, guide your deliberations in this matter. Um, those are two occasions where there has been um, disclosure requested, and of course it's operating under the previous environment because the UK legislation was not retrospective. And that concerns the Ministry of Transport and the Duchy of Cornwall and correspondence relating to the Marine Navigation Aids Bill. That was an, a decision issued on the 8th of February 2012. And correspondence relating from the Department of Business, sorry, correspondence relating to the Department for Business Innovation and Skills and again the Duchy of Cornwall regarding the Apprenticeship Skills Children and Learning Bill. And that decision was also issued on the 8th of February 2012. So I think that you're quite right, this is a, an important area. The Campaign for Freedom of Information has always been in principle opposed to an absolute exemption. We believe a public interest exemption should be retained and we urge the committee not to accept the, the bill as uh, in relation to that point. Okay, I, I mean, you, 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 I'll just correct you on something. The Scottish Parliament hasn't taken any decision on this issue. You know, the, the, the Scottish Government has brought forward a bill and we're here to scrutinise and to see whether or not we actually support it before it actually goes to Parliament and Parliament then take a decision on that. So, so but do you not accept the, what the Scottish Ministers have said is that they have to address anomalies in the current legislation before they actually think about and, um, widening it to cover other organisations. Uh, I mean, that, a statement to Parliament was made to that effect, and we've been in, informed in this committee that in actual fact that that is the intention of this bill, uh, is actually, and it, it, it's to actually make the, the legislation that currently exists more effective before effectively extending the coverage of it. We're not persuaded by those arguments because we've been promised consultation, we've been promised the use of Section 5 since 2002, and it's not happened. And um, the Scottish Government's analysis of the responses it received to the 2010 consultation concludes with the point that the Scottish Government also notes that the, at the time of the enactment of the amendment bill could provide opportunity for related orders to come into force, for example, section, under Sections 5 and 59 of the Act. Although the bill was published in June, that would have been the time to announce a specific timeline, a specific set of organisations to be brought within the scope of uh, the, the extension. But there's also a problem with the nature of the consultation in, 20, in 2010 because Section uh, 5 requires a consultation for the bodies to be covered and the only body uh, covered in that 2010 consultation was, um, for example, the Glasgow Housing Association, but there are over 50 other housing associations that could equally be brought within the scope. So um, that immediately creates a problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Sillers, uh, you know, in your uh, amendment, you uh, focus specifically on the bill itself, and you, you have two real concerns. One, again, is the public interest test with relation to the royal exemption. So I wonder if you can comment on that for the record also. And you also talk about the level of flexibility proposed, which you fear could uh, make a, create a, a far more complex system. I'm just wondering if you can advise us what uh, drawbacks you think that may actually have. Thank you, convener. I think I should say that the 
perspective that we've brought to bear is uh, not as is not policy driven uh, in any sense. It's really uh, the observations uh, of the uh, potential for administrative difficulties in uh, a little further down the line. So uh, my comments, I think, have to be prefaced by saying that um, I appreciate that this is an, an enabling uh, piece of legislation which will be subject to further um, articulation in terms of subordinate legislation, and I, uh, I understand that uh, those issues have been thought, thought about. The, in relation to uh, communications, uh, royal communications, what I would say is that, again, depending on how the uh, legislation is enforced, it may be that further down the line, uh, the, the result of the uh, amending legislation might be generally to mitigate against the general uh, thrust of openness uh, and increased openness that I think underpins the legislative initiative. Uh, and, and, but, but again, I have to say that that's not uh, a, a policy driven or um, a particularly deeply felt concern in relation to where we sit. Um, in relation to the point that you make about historical records, the, uh, the way the legislation is drafted um, clearly uh, provides for the possibility of different provision being made for records of different descriptions, exemptions of different kinds, and different purposes in other respects. And at the moment, the definition of historical records uh, has uh, intrinsically different uh, periods of time. And I suppose our concern is that the, the application on a less than very well considered uh, approach to this might result in a kind of geometric progression of different uh, time scales, which as we say in our original uh, consultation response, uh, might produce confusion, it might be difficult to uh, justify the differences, and it might be the legislation might uh, end up in a less user-friendly scheme. I fully appreciate that you've uh, considered the point, and uh, I and in the 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 reflections on that part of the uh, proposed legislation. A number of consultees welcome the increased flexibility and sensitivity that might be brought to bear in the legislation. But I suppose I would say that one consultee's in increased flexibility might reflect, as it does in our case, a slight concern um, that, uh, uh, of increased complexity in terms of the outcome. So I think really those are the points that I'd like to make uh, in response to your question. So in exchange for the kind of more flexible regime, what regime do you think should be imposed through this bill? Well, I, 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 in, in our original uh, consultation, we say there should be a set period for, for all of the categories. And I think that that has got going for it certainty and so on. But I fully understand that that may that may be offset um, by, uh, uh, again, how the legislation is used. And so, I, I mean, in the, uh, in, in the report uh, of your considerations of the consultation, I certainly uh, noted that thought would be given to the, the, the categories of, uh, the, of information and I dare say, as, par as part of that, identification could be made of the, the most used uh, um, aspects and thought given to if there, if, there, if there could be consistency amongst the most used areas of inquiry. And so I, I fully concede that 
um, our uh, original uh, response simply reflects a concern, I think, principally that a later stage thought is given as to how different periods could be um, made usable, well-known and highlighted to the users without, without it becoming particularly complex. Okay, just one final thing before I open it out to colleagues. Um, and what kind of timescales uh, do you think there should be on, on the release of information? And, I can, and uh, Ms. You, you could ask, answer that question as well, if you've got a view on that also in terms of release of documentation. Um, well, you know, I mean, historical records should be released after, you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. What, what is your view on the kind of, on, on what uh, time period we should, could be talking about? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the, the general view um, expressed by ministers through the bill is that, the, yeah. you know, where possible, records should be released earlier rather than yeah. later. So I'm just wondering yeah. what, if, you, if you have concerns over yeah. flexibility yeah. Um, and, and there should be fewer categories, what kind of time sure. skills should we perhaps I, be thinking about? To be honest, I don't have a strong view about that and I don't think uh, our organisation would have a strong view about that. I think like everyone else, we, are, uh, we, we certainly uh, uh, endorse a view that makes uh, m the material available earlier I mean, at the moment you're talking about, in some cases, period, historical periods of 60 and 100 years and so on. And I've, and I've noted the, the, uh, the, the move towards release in 15 years rather than 30 years and so on. And, uh, I, and uh, clearly, as a generality, we, we would welcome a move towards a shorter rather than longer period of uh, uh, a longer period. I know this will sound very much like uh, a sort of lawyer's answer, but I think it really does depend very much on the kind of material that you're talking about. Personal, personally sensitive material and so on, it may be, you know, uh, not appropriate for that to have such a short period, whereas I can under well understand that um, for the purposes of research, general knowledge and so on, there would be a desire to have that earlier rather than later. But I think I might defer to my more expert colleague here in relation to a, a, a thoughtful view on that. Uh, probably echoing what you say, the Campaign for Freedom of Information in Scotland supports the public's right to know, and we welcome the initiative by the Scottish Government to be more realistic and, and less um, dogmatic about <coughs> timescales. So the earlier, the better. OK, that's fine. Um, so I'll now open uh, the session out to colleagues, and it will be Michael to be followed by Joan. Thanks very much, Karina. <coughs> um, to, uh, to both of you, but uh, I'm not quite sure which one of you would most relate to this question, but the exemption that's intended um, to cover the monarchy, uh, my understanding is it covers communications between ministers and the monarchy. So who would be protected by this amendment? Would it be the monarch or would it be the ministers? Um, I suppose I would focus on the disadvantage and the impact of the amendment because the disadvantage would be the public would never have the right to know where it, at the moment if there is a public interest they would and the impact of this means also I suppose whoever is writing the correspondence need never fear that it would ever be made public so we we are in principle I mean this is an in principle opposition we are in principle opposed to absolute exemptions and we cannot understand why this has been proposed, why this has been copied and we see hugely negative impact. And could also just stress that um, you know, we support human rights, um, we support the right to privacy, so we're not looking at personal details here. We're look <laughs> what we are standing up for is the public's right to know if there is a public interest in them knowing. Have you any evidence of uh, FOI requests going in in relation to this? Uh, has there been any difficulty with them? Uh, have, have either ministers or uh, the royal household had to seek to defend uh, rulings by the information commissioner, which they were not happy with? Well, the two, the two cases that I have cited earlier that were delivered in February of this year where um, disclosure is required, one in full and one in part, um, that, that's new territory because it has been very difficult in the past 
to get information because, of course, the public interest applies. And I think it's, that's quite a proportionate response. We can trust um, public authorities and the UK Information Commissioner to exercise powers responsibly. But just from your experience then, in, in relation to use of FOI, um, in relation to public bodies, do you think there's a particular difficulty in getting information that does re relate to the, the monarchy? To be honest, it's not an issue that's ever particularly bothered me. Okay. Um, Deputy Convener to be followed by Elaine. Uh, thanks very much, uh, and thanks for your answer so far. One of the things I was suggesting last week to the Bill team was that uh, a number of councils uh, have effectively hived off parts of themselves. Uh, and Glasgow is an example, but I think a number have done it with, with the leisure side, especially in sport and things, uh, into separate bodies. Now, that then seems to me that what used to be covered by FOI then is no longer covered by FOI. So actually the amount of information is reducing. Can, can you confirm, is that your understanding of it as well then? Um, absolutely. Uh, we believe that the Section 1 right to access information in 2012 is much weaker than it was when the bill was first passed in 2002 and when it became effective on the 1st of January 2005. Um, the report from Audit Scotland that we quote in our evidence reveals that there are 130 LAOs now in existence. Um, and those are very often delivering services that used to be delivered by public bodies such as local authorities. Um, and also we know from that same report that um, the likelihood is that there will be further developments uh, in services being delivered by other bodies set up by public authorities. So we see this as a, a growing problem. And that's why we call for, in our evidence, um, a purpose clause in this bill, um, that the purpose of the bill has to be to entrench the public's right to know, because we cannot anticipate how public services or services of a public nature may be delivered in the future. And therefore, there has to be a focus on whatever body is created for whatever public pur purpose. It should be covered by freedom of information legislation. OK, yeah, thank you. Um, I, mean, I think it was... Uh, both Dr Murray and myself were asking uh, about some of these things last week and I think it was one of the answers to her questions that the suggestion was made by the Build team that there are other means of acquiring information mm -hmm. from bodies that are not covered and the wider transparency agenda is intended to cater for that. Uh, would you find that an acceptable answer? No, absolutely not, because we are talking about an enforceable right to know. Mm -hmm. Arguably, the whole strength of the freedom of information legislation is enforcing the public's right to know because we've always had the right to ask or email or phone and ask for information. Sometimes it was given, sometimes it wasn't. What changed everything on the 1st of January 2005 was that that right could be enforced. Therefore, uh, whatever you call it, a transparency agenda, an accountability agenda, a housing charter or whatever, we are talking about a simple and accessible right that can be enforced and people know what freedom of information is. The uh, research undertaken by the Scottish Information Commissioner shows a high degree of awareness in Scotland um, and also a great deal of respect and support for the right. Um, we had a letter from Mr Adam, which I think is on the public record, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, and, and he says, he, he, he's talking about the kind of current climate, that that might be a problem. He says, in addition, the Scottish Minister is acutely aware of the current economic climate and concerns over the impact additional regulation on hard-pressed businesses could have at this time. Have you any thoughts on that? Um, well, three thoughts. First of all, when Freedom of Information was first mooted um, by the Scottish Government in the, the consultation document really in 1999, in the document they say that there would be no extra money for the introduction of Freedom of Information. Um, they also saw it as a, a way to, to, to manage records more effectively. Um, secondly, I would say that um, freedom of information requests should be very minimal because there should be a proactive disclosure of information. Um, so if you disclose more proactively, then you've got less reason um, to deal with individual requests for information under Section 1. Um, but thirdly, it was also raised um, in the, the analysis of, of consultations um, that was published by the Scottish Government that the whole kind of cost factor wasn't really hugely onerous, and that was the view of, of some of the respondees. Um, so, in a sense, I think it's a bit of a red herring because what we've also found out from freedom of information requests, when ordinary members of the public 
who are receiving services can actually make FOI requests that ultimately lead to a saving of money and a more concentration of uh, scarce public resources. I don't know, Mr. Sills, if you're wanting to comment on any of these things, uh, I've been aiming them more at Ms. Ewart, I think. But I, I really don't have anything to add to what Carol has said. OK. And my final point would be another quote um, from Brian Adams' letter, which says, responses also showed no compelling evidence of a problem or of unmet demand for information. Uh, would you agree that there's no demand for unmet demand for information? Uh, no, I would not agree with that. Um, and in fact, I saw um, you giving evidence last week. Um, as I come back to the point, Section 5 requires consultation with those bodies likely to be covered. The, it's skewed, it's imbalanced, and it should also have a more effective consultation on those who may wish to access information so that there's a, a balance to that formal process. <coughs> and therefore, that's why it's skewed. Um, in the meetings that we've been attending recently around the amendment bill, um, it's been clear that people have repeated examples of information that they would like to receive that they have not got. Could you give us an example? Housing Association, for example. You know, and it's, it's interesting to know that housing associations have used FOI themselves, so they understand the benefit of it. Yes. Uh, you know, and coming back to the cost issue, um, you know, democracy costs money. You know, we're sitting in a building that costs money, but the fact is that if it's a treasured right, and we believe it's a fundamental part of a democracy, then there will be a consequential cost, but it's not a burden. It's actually a benefit of democracy. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, convener. As the vice convener said, uh, both he and I had been pursuing the issue of um, extension with the bill team, maybe slightly unfairly, because uh, it is probably more of a policy issue, and we can take that up with the Minister later. Um, I'm interested in what you were saying about this Scottish Shore Social Housing Charter, because that was the answer I received in, in respect of the difference between tenants of an RSL, which is funded by tenants' rents, and the Scottish Government's tenants of a council, who are funded by... <laughs> Yeah, council housing department funded by tenants' rents and, uh, and the Scottish Government. There does seem to be a bit of an imbalance in there. Can I ask you, um, this is an amendment of a bill. We were advised that there was we didn't need to bring in the extension through primary legislation because the ability was there through secondary legislation. Would you have preferred that the amendment had actually introduced that extension into primary legislation so it could be consulted on? Or are you happy with it being in secondary legislation but not happy about the lack of progress? Um, we think that 10 years after the legislation was passed, um, Section 5 is not fit for purpose because it has not operated the way that it should. Do you think the actual extension should be in primary legislation? Do you think that should be um, by the bill itself? The way around that is, of course, the public interest uh, purpose clause. Because if the whole point of this bill is about the public's right to know, rather than its current focus, which is what the public sector is prepared to share, the content and at their own pace, um, we think that that would change uh, the focus of how bodies are brought within the scope of freedom of information legislation. So the focus would be entirely different. Right, so, but that would actually we would require, it require in this consultation with all who might be interested at this stage, would it? Well, in a sense, we are, the, the, the consultation in a, has been used as a delaying tactic because we were promised consultation in 2002. And we genuinely thought Section 5 would operate efficiently, that you would consult, there would be a decision taken, and then more bodies would be covered by freedom of information legislation. And it's but, not happened. Would you be able to put forward to us an amendment to this bill that we could consider at Stage 2? Yes, that would be our intention. Can I ask you another slightly different issue? Um, certainly in my limited experience of freedom of information, it is far from easy to get freedom of information. Uh, 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 information. I can trying to find out details of correspondence and within just before the, the date at which you were supposed to have had a re uh, response, I got something asking what exactly what in emails and documents do you want? You know, as if you would actually know which letters before you'd actually had the, the freedom of information. Are we missing an opportunity here to actually make it easier for the public to get information? Because it seems to me that public bodies can prevaricate and they can put people off, and in the end, people just think, "What the heck?" and they give it up. I think that's a very good idea to have a more um, nuanced approach to the operation of the act, um, because yes, I'm party to those similar stories, um, the over-legalistic replies which come from public bodies that really put people off. 
Um, also, the fact that people are warned about disclosure and copyright law and so on. People maybe think then I shouldn't share this information with other parties. So, yes, I think we have to have a, 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 a nuanced debate about how freedom of information is operating. But coming back to the point you were making about the housing charter, um, at the moment you don't need to quote freedom of information legislation in order to get the information you're, you're requesting. I mean, if you talk about the housing charter or a transparency agenda, you're ex expecting ordinary members of the public to some, somehow know where their rights are placed, what box they're placed in, whereas at the moment freedom of information is a very simple process. The research by the Scottish Information Commission approves a high level of public awareness. It should be a simple, streamlined, enforceable right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'm going to frame my question slightly differently because it kind of follows on from the point you were discussing with Dr Murray there, and it was around the issue about Section 5. Um, you, you appear to have... Uh, I'm just going to seek clarity on, on your position because on the one hand you appeared to suggest in your initial evidence to the convener that you thought section 5 should just be done away with. It now would seem from where I'm hearing that, that you might be more amenable to an amendment to section 5 which would cover some of the consultation issues that you appear to have. So what what is the position of, of your organisation? Is it that section 5 is a dead duck, or is it that it could be amended in a sensitive fashion that would would deal with some of the issues you've raised? Um, to be honest, we're, we're refining our position in this because we have become so frustrated um, by the consultation process since 20, it is since, since 2002, as well as more recent promises, and the fact that we're still in a position where we still have no timeline, and no specific list of bodies to be covered. Um, and that has then led us to have a more rigorous examination of Section 5 and wondering, has it really ever operated the way Parliament intended? Could it be fixed by an amendment, um, such as balancing up the consultation process so that the, the users of freedom of information have equal um, consideration and deliberations? Um, and amending Section 4 to take on some of the responsibilities of Section 5. Um, so... Our view is that there has to be some inclusion in the bill of a public or of a purpose clause, and that the flexibility of adding in new bodies is um, actually less flexible than what what is currently in section five. Okay. Um, beyond that, as well, um, you know. I, Obviously, I appreciate the frustration that you must feel fr from the 2002 until now. There not having been a use of Section 5. I mean, is it your is it your belief that it's never going to be used, or are you willing to take at face value the the comments from the government that they are going to extend this or look at extending this once they've amended the legislation to make it, in their view, fit for purpose? I we're really just fed up waiting. Um, this is not the most, it's, it's not just this administration that promises have been broken. I mean, we want to emphasise that point. Um, and we still don't understand why, when the bill was published, there couldn't have been a timeline and a list of specifics. But even if there were specific organisations, it wouldn't go far enough. Because we know from the Audit Scotland report that there will be more bodies created in the future that will not, perhaps, from our reading then, may not be covered by freedom of information legislation. And that's why there has to be a purpose clause in the amendment bill so that new bodies are more easily covered by freedom of information legislation. Okay, thank you. Dave. Yes, uh, good morning. I good to see you here. Um, just a very simple and quick question. Maybe the two of you could uh, give me an answer to. Just wonder what your view is on the um, the retrospective as aspect of the reduction of the lifespan of exemptions. Um, should this only come in, you know, for, for those issues um, post the, the new legislation, or should it apply to, to everything? Should it be retrospective, basically? Um, I suppose, in principle, I don't like um, to miss an opportunity. Um, but I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll write to you on that point. I'll consider it in more detail. 
another letter, is it? <laughs> well, I think I think to be fair, uh, the the observations that we made are on a, a fairly narrow range of issues, and although. I suppose I do have a view. I think it would be wrong for me to be winging it now in relation to what we've submitted to you. So, uh, I, I, again, I think I would like to reflect on that. We don't have a formulated a view on the, on the position. Okay. Okay. Understanding is that the intention is to make it retrospective in actual fact, but um, we can clarify that with the Cabinet Secretary as I was intending to do so myself. So, well done for jumping in there, Dave. I'm just going to ask a question. Um, um, I think it will probably be yourself, Ms. Ewart, that will want to answer it, um, um, given that Mr. Sillers has, has, has mentioned that they've got a very narrow, uh, they're looking at very specific parts of the bill. And it's a time limit for proceedings, and it's just to see basically what your view is on the, the proposed change. Uh, as you know, that the prosecution is, it has to be brought within six months of offence being committed, and the plan is to change it uh, through this bill to six months from uh, from when uh, evidence is brought to, to light. Uh, what is your view on that amendment? Do you, do you feel that's a positive step in the right direction? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, of course, we were intrigued to find out that there has been a problem with time limits because, um, of course, it's extremely disappointing that there could be any destruction of documents. <clears throat> um, I suppose the question would be why three years? Well, again, because I think it's I think it's one of these things. I think it's, it's perhaps an arbitrary time period. To be honest, I think maybe they think three years is a reasonable thing. But that's again something we can ask. One of the things that I asked last week was how many such uh, um, uh, you know cases were actually. Um, not proceeded with because of the six-month rule, but we didn't get any information from the bill team last week, so hopefully we'll get some information from the Scottish Information Commissioner, which is who the bill team suggested we should actually ask. Yeah, and I think, I mean, today has been very powerful in terms of the disclosure of information um, following the Hillsborough tragedy, um, and it really does remind you that timelines can be unhelpful because the focus has to be on the public's right to know. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, I think that was record. We also agree with the uh, extension for or the amendments in relation to prosecutions and so on. Okay, thank you very much for, for your time this morning. I think that's exhausted our questions. Yes. I just add in um, a further sure. point. <clears throat> um, the Scottish government's six principles um, are, are very a very interesting framework for progressive reform of freedom of information. But I would just like to draw the committee's attention um, to. Principle five, which is um, the duty to maintain effective relationships with the Scottish Information Commissioner and other key stakeholders, and specifically the Scottish Public Information Forum is mentioned. Um, several times in my evidence, I've reiterated the point about a balanced perspective and freedom of information. It's not just about public authorities disclosing, it's about hearing people who want to access information. And we in the campaign recognise that the Scottish Public Information Forum was a most welcome and almost revolutionary process whereby public officials met um, with camp civil society, um, organisations like ourselves. Um, it met in places around Scotland and the public could attend and ask questions. And it afforded a level of scrutiny which was most impressive. And it is a matter of some regret that that hasn't really been maintained in the last couple of years. And we would hope that that would, um, would pick up again. Um, and finally, just to emphasise that we think that this bill should be about the public's right to know rather than about the, what the public sector chooses to disclose. And that's why that formed the whole nature of our evidence to this committee. OK, well, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr Sills, also. I'll just um, uh, give a, a suspend for one minute while we allow witnesses to change over. <laughs>
Okay, folks. Um, the committee will now hear from Rosemary Agnew, the Scottish Information Commissioner, and uh, Ewan McCullough from the Commissioner's Office, and I'd therefore like to invite the SIC to make a short opening statement. Thank you. Um, thanks you very much, everybody, for giving me this op opportunity to address you this morning and to speak on the proposed amendments independently of the questions. You'll be relieved to hear I don't intend to rehearse every single thing that we put in our written submission, but there are three significant things that I feel warrant highlighting at the outset. Um, the first of these, and it, it picks up to some extent something Mr Gibson said earlier, is it's, it's too easy in a process like this, like bill drafting, to focus on points of detail, and it's quite correct that we do, but there's a danger that in doing that, we lose some of the big messages. So my first point really is one of those big messages, and that is to remind the committee that overall, I welcome the proposed amendments to the Act, and on the whole, agree that they meet the general aim of strengthening and clarifying provisions. Having said that, I have two significant areas of concern, but these should not cloud the fact that there are many positive points about the proposals. And whilst I can understand perhaps there may be concerns about the relatively narrow scope of the amendments, uh, I take this narrow scope as a positive indication of the strength of the original drafting of the Scottish Act. Our Act simply doesn't need the same level of correction that the UK Act uh, went through earlier because we, in our original drafting, addressed many of the issues that came out of um, that uh, drafting in the UK and what we learned. So while there are amendments that provide clarity, such as the changes to timescales and Section uh, 65, which is uh, to bring an offence, uh, they are making the Act work better, they're not about fundamental change, with that one exception uh, that I'll come on to in a moment. Uh, the second area that I wish to comment on is that of the designation of new bodies. And to give you a slightly different perspective, I appreciate there are already powers in the Act to allow for other bodies to be brought into um, the Freedom of Information Net. And whilst I understand the logic of clarifying the Act before extending it wider, I am disappointed that the opportunity hasn't been taken to have the discussion about how and to where we extend FOISA, uh, Freedom of Information Scotland Act, and that we're not doing this at the same time because I think that this misses some serious and significant issues, some of which have been raised uh, in one form or another already. But it's easy to think of designation of additional bodies as something of an expansionist approach. Let's make it wider. Let's bring more in. Um, but I think it misses two very important things. Firstly, the focus should not just be on bodies, about which bodies you bring into the Act. It should also think about how we extend designation to information about public services because it's the information about how our public services are delivered that we want to preserve and enhance that right to know for. And, and we should think about whether uh, organisations who hold uh, bodies are appropriately designated, because there may be some bodies that 10 years ago it was appropriate, that with some form of review we find actually it's maybe not so appropriate. The world is changing very rapidly, so let's let's promote and have this review about how bodies are looked at. Um, but I think the second point about um, the designation is, for me, the most important one, and that is about preserving existing rights. Because there have been no orders under Section 5 since uh, the Act was enacted. But in that time, we've seen public services outsourced, outsourced subject to PFI, handed to external organisations to deliver. But what has not happened at the same time is the right to information about those public services has not migrated um, with them. So effectively, by standing still and not designating additional organisations, the real effect is that we have lost rights to information in Scotland. And a very graphic example of this is this housing one, because since FOISA was enacted in 2005, 
15,000 households have lost FOI rights as a result of the transfer of local authority housing stock. And these aren't my figures, these are Scottish Government figures. And that is just one area of public service. Um, so really, when we're talking about legislation remaining fit for purpose, uh, I would say with the value of our collective experience, we should be considering the appropriateness of organisations already covered, and we should be considering um, where we extend it to. And to pick up on some of the earlier discussion about Section 5 itself, we hadn't actually proposed an amendment, but one of the things that strikes me in terms of a weakness of Section 5 is the very opening line, Scottish ministers may by order. It's that word may. It makes it discretionary. It doesn't make it mandatory to have the debate, the review, the consultation about designation, which is, if, if we're going to make an additional amendment, is perhaps something we think about. It's all very well giving us rights, but if they're not being exercised, then, you know, or, or provision in here, then there's not a lot of point to them being there, really. Now, my third and final area is in relation to the amendment to Section 2, which impacts on Section 41A. We've all been dubbing this the Royal Exemption, um, and I'm sure that you are aware of the publicity that my concerns about this amendment, proposed amendment, have raised. So what I would like to do is, is to ensure that you understand where I'm coming from properly on this, because my concern that has raised a point of contention is fundamentally about the creation of another absolute exemption. By making the exemption absolute, it further undermines and further erodes rights to information. It removes from Scottish public authorities, and that includes me and the government as well as Scottish public authorities, the flexibility to consider the public interest in what can and can't be disclosed. Uh, bearing in mind that public authorities can be requesters themselves. Not only does it introduce another absolute exemption, but unlike existing absolute exemptions, and this is a key point, it's very wide-ranging. The proposed wording, anything which relates to, makes the scope very wide and, to a great degree, very uncertain. In contrast to other absolute exemptions where the information that is exempt is very clearly defined. It has boundaries around it, it has edges. But that would not exist in this. The relates to makes it so wide um, that it's, it's virtually unpredictable in what it might cover. Now, I know we've all heard the arguments that the exemption should be amended to make it consistent um, with the UK legislation. And while I can see the point that we quite like consistency, I think a more important consideration in relation to consistency is with our own Scottish legislation. Because by making the amendment as proposed to Freedom of Information Scotland Act to keep it in step with the UK, I think, um, as you use the phrase, copy, um, what it will do is it will take our freedom of information legislation out of step with um, other uh, information, such as Scottish Environmental Information Regulations, the EIRs. Now, not only would it bring us out of step with EIRs in Scotland, it would also bring us out of step with um, EIRs in Europe because it is derived from a European directive. And there's an important point to note there that we couldn't automatically put that inconsistency right by amending the EIRs because we cannot uh, simply amend them where an amendment might lead to a restriction of right, which is what it would do. Um, now, what it will leave us with is, is somewhat of a ridiculous situation where under Freedom of Information Scotland Act, information could be withheld, but under EIRs, we must release it, even though there's an absolute exemption under Section 2 and Section 41. Now, the inconsistency, it's both undesirable and it's confusing for requesters and those who not only have to respond to information requests, but also the public authorities. We all have um, a, a duty to give advice, and it's just making the complexity of advice giving um, more, more uh, difficult as well. So we, I, 
we shouldn't lose sight of this, but also we shouldn't lose sight of the fact the English-UK Act was rushed through their uh, late stages without full, full consultation. And here in Scotland, we are not rushing our amendments through. We're consulting widely. So I really strongly urge you to give the, the proposal as it stands um, full consideration for the actual impact of what it will mean for us. I also think we need to retain some perspective on the Section 2 amendment because, in reality, there are a few requests. Appeals to the Commissioner are very few. Um, and whilst I can see some might argue that if that's the case, then so what? What's the big deal in changing it? Um, I'd argue the opposite. I would argue that what it demonstrates is that um, the fact there are so few and that information hasn't been inappropriately disclosed indicates current provisions provide adequate protection and work effectively. In other words, if it ain't broken, why are we bothering to fix it? Um, thank you. So, fire away. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure you've answered quite a lot of the questions that members of the committee would want to ask, but there's a couple that I'm going to ask that have come basically from the statement you've put, as opposed to what we have already uh, in writing uh, before us. I mean, you talked about, um, you know, um, we need to... Um, have an appropriate designation for additional bodies that could be covered by the Act. I just want to ask you what kind of criteria should really be used in terms of that. I mean, you talked about, for example, um, Alio's, you know, arm's length organisations uh, as a potential example. So, so how would you actually define what should really be covered by any uh, uh, bodies that should additionally be covered? Should um I'm glad you asked the question. Um, I think it's not as as simple as perhaps saying it should follow the public pound or it should follow a function that has been um, transferred to another body. And picking up on something, uh, Carol Hewitt said, it's not just about consulting people who currently pr have information rights that might be lost. I think there also has to be a focus on provision of public service. And this is a more difficult one because at what point does it stop being a public service if it's delivered by a different type of organisation? Um, in terms of setting out criteria, I think part of the problem that we face is because there's been no attempt through Section 4 to make an order under Section 5, we've never actually had the discussion of how you would go about designating and who they would go to. And that's something that I would really welcome because it's not a simple answer. It's not as simple as a tick list saying, well, we think it should be this, we think it should be this. A good starting place, for example, could be, does it fall under public and administrative law? Is it something that is provided for under public law? And if so, should there be a right to information about how that's accessed? Whether the public pound goes as well, I think, is, is an important but not the only consideration. Um, but beyond that, um, I really don't have anything further to say. OK, thank you. Now, uh, in your submission, your very last uh, paragraph, you said, uh, I note the statement from January 2011, which certain ministers believe that it would be premature to extend coverage before the deficiencies in the Act could be uh, put right. And you talk about, as you've mentioned already this morning, you know about the government moving swiftly, etc. Do you feel that, it's, that, that that is the case, that it would be premature to extend coverage at this point, uh, you know, taking into account what you've said is that further um, action should be uh, proposed by the Scottish Government once this amendment is uh, passed, if it is indeed passed, this amendment bill? I don't think it's ever premature to extend a right that existed back to where it existed in the first place. Because this, um, my, my fundamental point about designation is the rights that have been lost. And I cannot see mm. that it's ever premature to re-extend rights that were there in the first place. So, so you don't really accept the Scottish Government's premise that we really should resolve the flaws in existing legislation before extension? I understand it, but I don't totally accept it because the flaws that are being put right are really not about um, huge, huge changes to the Act. The Act on the whole works well um, within the intention of it in the first place. And the fact that there is a logic to let's, let's get all the clarification right is fine. 
but we could still extend it and put those right at the same time. So we are disappointed that the uh, at least hadn't promoted the debate about it. You know, picking up on the point Carol Ewart made about timelines, what we have is a section in an act that says you may designate. We have nothing further than that, despite all sorts of people, uh, myself and the former commissioner, um, making that point over and over again, that there has been no um, enactment or no orders under Section 5. OK, thank you. Um, the Scottish Government's six principles of freedom um, are under those. One of its principles commits to adjusting the regime where it is necessary and sensible to do so, uh, and the Bill uh, seeks to fulfil this principle. Do you agree with that? I think it fulfils the sensible. I would question the extent to um, the other aspects of it because the fact that we are having a debate about um, lack of designation has led to an erosion of rights really does question the extent to which the principle of it is being followed. Um, and whilst I can appreciate that some might argue that principle is a matter of timing at the moment, um, what we haven't had is a clear statement of when that principle will be applied. Okay, and just one more question before I, I open the, the session out to colleagues. And it was a question I asked last week, actually, of the, of the Bill team, and it was in relation to a number of prosecutions that, uh, that have not been able to be proceeded with. Uh, I'm sure you, you're well aware this is going to be asked. And, of course, the <coughs> Scottish Government team suggested that, uh, and we actually put this information really to yourself. So it was just to one ask how many, you know, because this is obviously a key part of the Bill, uh, how many prosecutions have been effectively, um, you know, stymied because of the, the legislation as currently is? We've had eight cases that we have given very serious consideration to applying Section 65, and in seven of those, timing was a factor. But I would add, it doesn't really matter whether it's one or whether it's one million. The point is that the timing needs to be put right, so we welcome the amendment to Section 65 very much. OK, and, and you'll obviously have the question to, to, that was put to Carol Ewart, and and she obviously expressed concerns about the three-year time bar that would then uh, that we, that is included in the bill. What's your view on that? I, I think there has to be a, a matter of proportionality um, in all of this, and I see the three-year uh, as a as a long stop because. In reality, it would be very difficult to actually affect a prosecution after that time, um, and I'm. I'm fairly confident that anything that was going to emerge would probably emerge within 12 months of discovery. And, and the key change here is that it, it relates to discovery rather than commission. So I'm not overly concerned about the three years. OK, thank you very much. Um, Elaine, to be followed by Michael. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, uh, thanks for your evidence. You've actually covered a lot of the points that we've been uh, thinking about. Um, I know what you're saying about in terms you could strengthen Section 5 by substituting shall for may. I have to say I've had arguments with government ministers over the years about you know, substitution of those words, and there's quite often a resistance to, to putting shall in instead of may. Um, do you also believe that the point which Carol you made that the consultation is asymmetric at the moment because it, it, it tends to concentrate on the public bodies who would be the subject of FOI and the insufficient need to consult with those who might represent those who wish to use a FOI. Do you think that should be strengthened if we were I going to strengthen it that section? I think it should because the whole purpose of this is right to know, not right to provide. So we should be asking people about what they want the rights to know about and from whom, not asking people who provide it, do you think they should have the right to know about it? So yes, I think we should. The other issue I raised with the previous witnesses was the difficulty sometimes that there is in getting information and the ability of public, the public sector bodies to prevaricate and to obfuscate either by asking for detail of what you want to know when you've already asked them. Or indeed one of my colleagues who got something, a ream of papers back from a FOI request, which obviously if you're a member of the public would be quite difficult to sift through to get the information you actually wanted to know. Uh, is, would, is there an opportunity in this amendment to make that easier for a member of the public to get the sort of information they're asking for? 
I think there is, but I don't necessarily think that you're ever going to provide for that within legislation, um, absolutely. What we have is a duty to provide advice and information, um, advice and guidance, on, and that's on all public authorities. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about is equipping authorities to give the right sort of advice and information, because if you give the person making the request the time, the advice, the guidance they need at the time they're making the request. What you have is an investment of time that makes it easier for you to answer it and easier for the person asking to know what they're asking for and in what form they're asking for it. So I, I think what we're talking about is, is a cultural shift rather than a legislative shift. Okay, Michael to be followed by Mark. I'd like to go back and revisit the question that I asked of the previous uh, witnesses because I, I sort of obviously got caught out in the, the issue about who was going to be protected by the absolute uh, exemption, whereas you seem to be indicating it's not about whether the royal family is protected or ministers are protected because the, the system seems to be working at the moment. Your concern is about going to an absolute exemption. Is that that's that's that right. right. Uh, because what an absolute exemption effectively does is it removes the right to information, and I I I think it would be a retrograde a retrograde step for us to remove a right when we've no evidence that what's already provided uh, within the act is is not doing its job well, because it appears to be. So there's already adequate provision for uh, the royal family, in my view. There is already adequate provision in terms of any discussion that any public authority um, may need to have that's confidential or covered within other rights or is a matter of national security. And it's not just ministers, it's all public authorities. So I think we've already got those protections there. I'd, what this will do is, is simply take away that, um, that right for the public consideration, the public interest test. It's a really valuable and powerful thing, and it already acts as an adequate safety net. Um, I, I suppose I've just got nothing really more I can say on that other than I fundamentally disagree with it. So I don't have an extensive knowledge of, of what the, the current legislation uh, permits, but I'm assuming from what you're saying that you think this is a dangerous precedent that would be set. Absolutely. Um, that yeah. There's no absolute exemption at the moment, and there's therefore no evidence that these uh, absolute exemptions are required and serve any purpose. Ab absolutely. I, I don't think they would serve the purpose other than to undermine um, the rights that already exist. Okay, Mark, to be followed by John. Yeah, thank you, convener. Interested when Dr Murray spoke about reams of paper in a response, having received that myself, the irony being it was in a request regarding tree preservation orders. But um, <laughs> Dr Murray kind of dealt with the, the point I wanted to raise. Um, and uh, it was around your, your issues around Section 5. We'd, we'd heard evidence earlier around Section 5 and the weakness of Section 5 being um, who was consulted. Um, it would seem that your view on the weakness of Section 5 is that it contains the phrase may by order. Now, my understanding is that's quite a standard phrase within legislation. And I just wondered what your view would be if we were to change that to shall by order uh, would be in terms of the setting of a precedent for other legislation. I, I think I was using it as much as an example of why the weakness exists. The fact that the word may makes it almost discretionary, if you like. It gives you the power, but it doesn't um, make you use the power. Um, I wouldn't go so far today as to say, oh, I think you should change it to this or that. I think what I would want to do is, if there is a prospect of amending Section 5, is to come back to you with a carefully considered um, suggestion of a form of words. Okay, that kind of deals with the supplementary angle that I was <laughs> going to come at, so I'm, I'm done <laughs> with my you. questions now, convener. Okay, well, if he's having a conversation, I'll just carry on. With, um, about the, oh, the proceedings of this committee, I would <laughs> say. Uh, um, yes, deputy to convener, at least right. for the time being. Thank you. <laughs> um, you, you have, uh, as Agnew touched on, uh, some of the issues I was raising previously, and I think especially you've emphasised, as I understood it, that uh, the fact that parts of the public sector have actually left the public sector has taken them out with the uh, legislation 
uh, which might previously have been within it. Um, and you specifically mentioned uh, housing or that suggestion. I mean, I was going to ask you, it was suggested in one of the letters, I think, from Brian Adam, that there was no compelling evidence of unmet demand for information. And I wondered around housing, is there confusion amongst the public, do you think, as to, because one tenant can get information about their landlord because it's a council, and one tenant cannot get information about their, uh, their landlord because it's a housing association. Uh, do, do you get a lot of people coming to you looking for information and then you have to say, well, unfortunately, housing associations are not covered? I'm, I'm not sure I could say that we get that many inquiries about it. I think they are more likely to have been dealt with at the, the first stage, the stage where perhaps people are contacting local authorities. As regards lack of evidence, if you've not gone looking for the evidence, then you won't have found it. Um, I'm not sure how much actual work has been done to uh, establish whether people understood that this right had been lost, because I think Carol made quite an important point, and that is, under freedom of information, you don't have to know that you've got the right in order to exercise it. You simply have to ask for information, and because of the way the Act is drafted, that invokes your right for you. Um, and I think housing is a good one to focus on, um, in the sense that there are ways of, of getting it, but all it really does is um, give a channel for information. It doesn't give a right to receive it. And it only exists for one area. There are all sorts of other um, public services that are now out with the, the freedom of information regime. You know, if you look at the number of PFI contracts in Scotland, if you, you know, this includes schools, hospitals, prisons, um, they don't have the, the same rights even as, as people who are tenants of housing associations. So the issue, I think, is, is much more uh, you know, serious than just saying it's just housing people. No, I, I was just uh, yeah. using housing as an example because uh, you would have some tenants on, uh, in and some tenants out, in a sense. Um, I mean, your, your point you made, w would I be right in thinking then that probably quite a lot of people might go to their own housing association and say, under FOI, I want to know, and the housing association says we're not covered, and they'll just accept that. They'll not necessarily come to you, so you wouldn't see that kind of case. Yeah, we wouldn't necessarily. They might a few yeah. come to us, don't they? I think it's fair to say there has been a steady trickle of inquiries about the coverage of housing associations right through the time FOIS has been in force. And there's also a degree of potential for inconsistency here again, as the Commissioner mentioned in relation to the IRs and in another context, in that there is the potential for a housing association to be covered by the IRs where they wouldn't be covered by FISA, which again leads to potential confusion. I mean, you were talking about you know people have the right, if, as long as they ask the question, they don't yet actually need to know they have a right. I, I've got a kind of feeling that sometimes when you go to some of the councils perhaps and you say to them, please give me certain information, they say no. But if you ask exactly the same question and say, and this is under FOI, they actually do give it. Is, is that your experience as well? Um, I can't say that it's my personal experience. Um, I think what it does is highlight the importance of the work that we do on assessments, because part of my um, remit is not just about appeals under FOI, it's also about assessment of practice. and. We find that generally in assessments, most staff at frontline seem to know that they uh, must treat every request for information as an information request, um, but we still find ourselves making recommendations about training and awareness that this is what it means. So it's obviously not 100% coverage, but I couldn't give you a, a view as to what that percentage was. I think. Our views are, on the whole, people do know, mm -hmm. and on the whole, people do do that. But this, again, comes back to something that I feel quite strongly about in equipping local authorities and um, public bodies. And uh, in, It's not just about helping requesters. It's also about ensuring that your own staff and your own culture know that this right exists and that they have to go some way to helping people exercise it. Yeah. Yeah, another quote from uh, Brian Adams' letter was that uh, expansion would be difficult in the current economic climate. Uh, 
that suggests presumably there's quite a, a cost to businesses or others who might be included. Is that your view? Uh, no, because I think that if you only ever look at things in terms of cost, you miss um, two points. One is the point that um, Ms Hewitt made about democracy isn't free. But the other point I think that it misses is that if you embrace freedom of information and understand its value in terms of communication of the organisation wider. And it's not just about freedom of information requests, it's about your publication scheme, about your proactive publication. It, there can be benefits to the organisation. Um, there's always, I, I think, a fear that you know, there's reputational risk in giving things out. Well, there's huge reputation risk in not giving information and I think if it was considered holistically within organisations at a very senior level and the benefits of it understood um, that would go some way to ameliorate this fear but I, I think there are benefits to it as well for organisations which I can't put a number on but I don't think it's all cost. I mean, kind of linked in with that too, the Bull team uh, last week were talking about there were other means of transparency, and, and that's, is that almost what you're saying, that uh, if, if a good organisation adheres to industry standard, it will publish information? So, by that logic, we wouldn't need to expand FOI? Um, I think there's, there's a danger with transparency to um, perhaps lump everything into, if we're transparent, everybody will get what they want and what they ask for and it, it works to a point but transparency works on the basis of the information you give out so that assumes you understand and know what everybody is ever going to want or want to know about and a lot of freedom of information requests are very personal they're about very specific information that a transparency um, approach would go some way to meeting <coughs> but not all the way to meeting. So I think transparency is an important piece of the information puzzle, but I don't think it's the only one, and that freedom of information rights are fundamental to making sure that all information that people need and want to know about can be made available. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Just uh, Dave, um, who's too shy to ask a question in this section of... The session appears um, on, re on the, the issue of whether or not yeah, the bill should be retrospective. <laughs> um, <laughs> although you did ask it in the last one, but I mean, in your submission, you, you, uh, you've said that uh, your view is that the reduction in lifespan of exemptions sh should be fully re um, retrospective. Um, and obviously, I've got your response here in front of me. I just wonder, for the record, if you can comment a wee bit more on why you feel that should be the case. Historical records exist. They're there now. And if there is an argument for um, introducing that amendment now, then why not have that amendment apply to the records that already exist? Because it must be the records that already exist that have given rise to the questions and the debates. So I think it's just as simple as saying we're fully in support of it being retrospective because we think it's appropriate that it's about access to the information, not about the timing of when they come in. Thank you very much. And just if, is there any further points you would like to make to the committee? I think I've probably covered my main ones. Thank you. You probably have. Well, thank you uh, very much. We're well ahead of uh, our time, so I'm going to uh, suspend the session until 10.55.
I will now reconvene the session of the Finance Committee and I therefore like to welcome Nicola Sturgeon, uh, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities, and her officials Zoe Mockery, Andrew Gunn and Mark Richards to uh, today's uh, committee. And I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I'm delighted to be here. Um, freedom of information was probably not the most remarked upon of my new responsibilities in the Cabinet reshuffle last week, but um, nevertheless, it's an extremely important one uh, and one that I'm uh, delighted to be taking over. Um, this is a, a good opportunity for uh, me to provide evidence uh, to the Committee on the Freedom of Information Amendment Scotland Bill. Um, I know you've heard earlier on this morning from uh, some stakeholders, and I'm, I'm certainly uh, happy to answer any questions later on that arose from those sessions. Uh, obviously, um, the Freedom of Information Act is a relatively new piece of legislation, uh, but notwithstanding that, I think it's a, a very positive uh, sign that it is already so embedded across our public authorities and widely recognised across Scotland as a key statutory right. It's good to note, although I don't think we should ever be complacent, uh, the former uh, Scottish Information Commissioner's uh, view that the freedom of information regime that we have in Scotland is widely recognised as being uh, both strong and uh, withstanding international scrutiny. As a government, we are uh, proud of the record that we have in meeting our own obligations under the Act, as well as in making information proactively available wherever possible. Um, information is released in response to the vast majority of requests that we receive, uh, and over 70% of decisions from the Scottish Information Commissioner uh, either wholly or partially have gone in our favour. Uh, it's also worth noting, although it's, it's quite a daunting uh, statistic, that in the interest of openness, the Scottish Government website contains around about 600,000 pages of information. Um, the bill, as uh, you will be aware, really has its origins in the desire to remove what are perceived to be two weaknesses in the Act. Uh, the intention is to pave the way for more information to be made public earlier uh, and also uh, to uh, allow the prosecution, uh, the provisions for a prosecution for an offence under the Act to be strengthened. Uh, and broadly speaking, more generally speaking, uh, the Act is uh, seeking to, the, this bill is seeking to improve the operation of the Act. So, for example, uh, it promotes, as I indicated a moment ago, further openness by allowing reduced lifespans for exemptions. It seeks to clarify some unclear drafting in the original Act and it provides some additional protection for personal data. Uh, the most controversial element of the bill uh, has been around the limited change to the public interest test in respect of communications with Her Majesty. Uh, the intention of that amendment is to ensure consistency of approach across the UK in respect of both the current and the future head of state, and I'm, I'm sure that's one of the issues we'll touch on uh, later in the session. Uh, one uh, final item I just want to touch on, because I know you've uh, discussed this and we'll want to discuss it further, is around extension of coverage. Um, as I think my officials uh, said last week when they gave evidence to the committee, uh, this bill is not about extension of coverage, and you know we're very clear about that. Uh, extension has been subject to consultation, that's required by the Act, uh, and a decision has been deferred until the Scottish Parliament has scrutinised this amendment bill. Um, the point I would reiterate, and I'll expand on this uh, later on if members wish me to, is that the Act already contains the power to extend coverage. So our view is that primary legislation is not required to extend coverage. Uh, I also think that we shouldn't see formal extension of coverage as the only way of ensuring access to information held by bodies that are not currently covered by the Act, you'll probably be aware, for example, of the conclusions recently of the House of Commons Justice Committee when they were uh, doing post-legislative scrutiny of the UK Act. Uh, and the committee said uh, then that contracts often provide a more practical basis for applying FOI to outsource services than partial designation of commercial companies under the Act. So I you know, absolutely understand uh, the desire for more access to information. I think we've just got to be mindful, firstly, uh, that primary legislation is not necessarily required for that and that there may be more than one way of achieving that. And I'm sure these are discussions that we will return to later after, uh, hopefully, we've passed this Act. Uh, the final point I would make, convener, and then I'll be happy to take questions, is just to reaffirm the government's uh, commitment to promoting transparency 
and operating as openly as possible. As I said at the outset, I'm new to uh, this subject and I'm, I'm keen uh, both today and in the future to have discussions uh, with the committee and with other stakeholders about how we give uh, life or continue to give life to these principles. Uh, we plan consultation uh, with key stakeholders uh, on the further development of a Scottish transparency agenda uh, later this year and I'm, I'm sure and I would hope that the committee would want to take an interest in that as well at that time. So with those introductory comments I'm happy to take questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much and as is usually the case in this committee I usually kick off with a few questions and then we open it obviously out to other members of the committee and I think it would be remiss of me not to start off with what has probably been one of the most contentious issues and you've touched on it already which is of course, uh, the, the royal exemption. And there are concerns, obviously, that this is more wide-ranging than it requires to be. Re uh, concerns that it wasn't actively consulted on and indeed is a, a retrograde uh, step. Um, I, I understand your comments and indeed the information we've received uh, in terms of the bill about trying to ensure there's consistency of approach across the British Isles, given that we have a shared a monarchy, but as uh, as has been pointed out by uh, Rosemary Agnew and her own uh, contribution just before you came in, uh, it, it means that the legislation would be out of step with our own Scottish legislation, uh, particularly in, in terms of EIRs, uh, as you will have heard earlier on today. So I'm just wondering how you kind of square that circle between, uh, you know, uh, having a, a kind of a consistent approach across the British Isles. Uh, or the United Kingdom, I should say, but not necessarily uh, with our own legislation in terms of this area, whereby someone can put um, an FOI in under an EIR, but not actually under the Freedom of Information legislation once this bill is enacted, if indeed it is so. OK, can I say firstly, in response to your kind of opening uh, comments there about uh, the scope of uh, what we're talking about here in this bill and, and consultation. I mean, let me be very clear, we'll listen very carefully to uh, the views expressed um, at this stage of the process, both by stakeholders and ultimately by the committee, and, and that will inform uh, our thinking for stage two of, of the legislation. So I'm, I'm very interested to hear uh, the points that are made. Um, I think it's important to reiterate the motivation for this amendment. It is to bring Scottish legislation into line with legislation in the rest of the UK, the, the Queen and uh, her successors are uh, head of state, uh, not just of uh, the rest of the UK, but of Scotland uh, as well. And I think there is a very, very strong and compelling argument uh, that the arrangements for dealing with communications between the monarch um, and, for example, uh, the Prime Minister's office should be the same as those that pertain to communications between the Queen and the First Minister's office. And you know that consistency point, I think, is important. The other point I would make in that respect before coming on to the European uh, regulations is that I think it's important to uh, remember that information relating to uh, Her Majesty as well as other members of the royal family or indeed the, the wider royal household uh, are still subject to the Act and there's no automatic requirement to apply exemptions to relevant information. And you know, if you look at some uh, comparisons not too far away from here in the Republic of Ireland where information relating to the President is simply not accessible uh, at all via Irish Freedom of Information legislation. So uh, I think that's a, a point worth making. And uh, lastly, uh, in, in this general um, part of my answer, uh, the exemption uh, that we are uh, talking about here has very rarely been applied, uh, certainly by Scottish ministers, in responding to information requests. I mean, annual reports show just two instances of this uh, since 2008. All three decisions that have issued to date by the Scottish Information Commissioner have upheld the application of the exemption. In one case, however, the public interest uh, ruled in favour of release. Um, in terms of the uh, your point about inconsistencies between uh, the freedom of information regime and uh, the European regulations, I think it is important to say we're not dealing with a like-for-like -like situation. Uh, the origins of these two regimes are very different. One uh, originated in Europe, the other is very much a devolved issue. Um, and there are significant inconsistencies that already exist between freedom of information uh, and the European uh, regulation position. Whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, it is a statement of fact that you know there are a number of inconsistencies between uh, these two regimes. There's no easy match-up uh, of exemptions, exemptions, and, and the terminology and the scope of exemptions differs uh, quite considerably. And I think it is the case that it, you would only ever 
uh, eliminate completely inconsistencies if you combine the two pieces of legislation. Uh, what we are doing here, of course, is making sure that we don't open up an inconsistency in the position uh, between Scotland and the rest of the UK when it comes to dealing with communications from Her Majesty. Okay, a couple of points. First of all, you know, the, the Queen is also the Head of State of Canada and New Zealand, Australia, for example, and I don't believe that they have consistent relations with the, the UK in terms of this particular issue. So uh, I don't think because we have a shared monarchy we necessarily have to have the same rules and regulations. So I just wanted to comment on that point. Secondly, um, the, the Information Commissioner has stated uh, clearly that absolute exemptions are not regarded as good practice. And I consider this measure to be unnecessary. And quite clearly, the overwhelming evidence that we've received as a committee is that there doesn't seem really to be much really to support this amendment being included, uh, and it is considered to be a retrograde uh, step, and that it's actually narrowing the kind of uh, opportunities for people to actually access information under freedom of information. Well, firstly, in relation to your point about Canada and uh, Australia, I. I my, my remit doesn't yet uh, extend to, to speaking for the governments. They'll be very relieved uh, to hear. Um, so I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to kind of comment directly on, on their freedom of information uh, regimes. I think I've, I, I don't want to repeat myself, I think I've set out the, the government's uh, motivation for this change. Um, I do think that it would be uh, strange uh, to have a situation where communications between the monarch and the Prime Minister were treated differently than, between, than communications between uh, the Monarch and, and the First Minister, and, and that is uh, the motivation uh, for this. In terms of your more general point, I hope, you know, I, I sort of appreciate that I'm new to uh, this particular responsibility, and, you know, I uh, have got some uh, work to do to uh, outline, you know, my approach to and, and persuade those who rightly, like I do, passionately believe in openness and transparency and, and access to information uh, wherever possible, that you know that's the, the kind of spirit in which I'll conduct uh, these responsibilities. I, I agree with the information commissioner that absolute exemptions are not things that you would want to apply lightly or regularly and frequently. I think where there is a, a proposal to do that, then it has to be well-founded. Um, and I think the consistency argument that I've given is the, the foundation for this, and I think it's a strong one. Okay, uh, thank you. You, you talked uh, you, uh, about uh, and said that openness should follow public money when public services are outsourced and that can best be achieved through clear and enforceable contract provisions rather than by designating uh, commercial companies under the Act. Um, so how does the Scottish Government encourage NHS boards and local authorities to prepare such clear and enforceable contract provisions? Well, what I was saying uh, was I was looking to the future and I should say, first of all, um, as I said in my opening remarks, this bill is not about extension of coverage. Um, my own position, again, as, as new to this uh, brief, is to be open-minded about extension uh, of coverage. And you know, after uh, we've had the parliamentary scrutiny of this bill, uh, that's something that the government has said very clearly we want to, to look at and have a, a debate and a discussion about to inform any future decisions that we might take. The, the points I was making, the point I was making, was twofold. Firstly. Uh, the power to extend coverage is already in the Freedom of Information Act um, and therefore to those who say we should have addressed this in this bill, I would simply say we, we don't need primary legislation to give us the ability to extend coverage. It, it's there. The fact that it may not have been used doesn't mean that that power is not there. And the second point I was making was really just um, wasn't to say this is my settled view. It was simply to say when we come to have this discussion, let's make sure that we're looking at all of the options that exist. It may be that the use of the existing schedule and the Act to formally extend coverage is something we should do uh, in particular circumstances, but it may also be that a better way to do it is to look in future at how we make uh, contract provisions stronger around the public's right to access information where public money um, is in play. Uh, so I'm simply saying there are different options. I'm not saying I've got a settled view one way or the other on what option is best uh, at this stage. In terms of your point about uh, NH NHS is obviously uh, subject to freedom uh, of information uh, legislation at, at the moment. Um, and I think in terms of uh, contracts, whether it's NHS contracts with uh, commercial uh, organisations or uh, local authorities or other public authorities, um, I think there is a debate to be had about how we make sure we've got the right balance in terms of commercial confidentiality and the public right to access appropriate information. I think we appreciate that the number of bodies uh, being you know, subject to FOI 
is uh, already you know available under the current legislation. But there is a clear concern that over the last decade that hasn't happened. And uh, although it's not directly included in this bill, uh, there is concern that there has been no statement as to when this is likely to take place, when there is likely to be extension. And because a number of bodies actually, which used to be um, uh, you know, covered by this bill uh, when it was first enacted, no longer are because of uh, you know, being uh, taken out of the, of the public sector or whatever, then uh, there is real concern about that. So it's, it, a lot of people who in the submissions to this committee have made it quite clear, and indeed uh, Professor Colin Reid of University of Dundee Law School says this is the most serious issue in need of attention. I'm just wondering um, when the Scottish Government will look to actually increase, increase the number of bodies and what the criteria they would use to actually increase the number of bodies? Well, firstly, in terms of uh, your first point, you know, I, I'm, I'm not arguing that over you know, a decade that provision in the bill hasn't uh, been used. I'm, I'm simply saying that that doesn't mean it's not there. And that point I was making was to say that you don't need new primary legislation to create that power. The power is already there. Um, we said very clearly that uh, we want to uh, defer uh, the discussion around extension of coverage until after this bill has completed its parliamentary process. I'm happy to give a commitment and assurance to the committee today that I will come back um, at that stage and discuss with you in broader terms how the government then might take forward uh, that consideration. Um, I think it's important at, at this stage, given that we have taken that decision to defer, that I, I don't get into a preemptive discussion about what particular bodies. I, I know as well as you do uh, some of the, uh, the the bodies and the the kinds of contracts that people uh, want to have access to information about. But I think it's important I don't preempt that discussion by starting to name individual organisations uh, just now. But there's a debate to be had there, and I'm certainly up for that debate, and I would welcome uh, the contribution of, of the committee. So uh, there's a, a, an invitation if you want to invite me back after uh, this bill to uh, have that uh, discussion and for me to set out at that stage a process and a timescale uh, for the, the consideration uh, that you uh, and the stakeholders you've spoken to uh, want and which we've already uh, said that uh, we want to have as well. I'm uh, sure we'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to open it out to other colleagues in a second. Just got one further question, and that is just about the reduction in the lifespan of e exemptions. Are, is it going to be fully retrospective, uh, as recommended by the Information yeah. Commission? Yeah, yes. I mean, obviously, the, the Scottish Government, as you know, already operates taking a 15-year rather than a 30-year rule. The, the reason for uh, the amendment to the Act here is to firstly uh, make sure that we can... Uh, ensure that that uh, approach is the same with public, other public bodies, but also uh, under the Act at the moment, we could only apply a blanket reduction in the lifetime of exemptions, whereas there may be some categories of information, for example, around child protection, where it was appropriate to still have a longer period, other categories of information would be appropriate for a shorter period. As the Act stands just now, uh, we can't discriminate like that is a you know a blanket provision so this act allows us to look at particular categories where we would want to and after this act is through it would be our intention to bring forward uh, secondary legislation to look at uh, putting that into practice okay thank you uh, i'm now going to open it out and uh, elaine to be followed by john thank you uh, convener and Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, for explaining why this is also on your uh, many list, your long list of uh, tasks. You must be able at multitasking, like many women, I think. Um, you said in your evidence that uh, the bill is not about an extension of coverage uh, because it contains the powers to introduce secondary legislation to extend. Can I ask you, why is that? Because this surely was an opportunity to bring forward extension of, co of coverage. And I'm sure you, I don't know whether you, ha you or your officials had the opportunity to listen to the evidence we had earlier, but there's clearly a disappointment that successive governments over 10 years have promised to have consulted, indeed have consulted, and yet it hasn't resulted in any extension of coverage. Uh, there's been a suggestion that um, amendments could be brought forward to the bill to strengthen that. Uh, and in particular now, as I said earlier, I've had debates with ministers over the years about substituting shall for me in legislation uh, but 
is this not an opportunity when, where we could have addressed some of the concerns about a lack of progress on extension? Let me, first of all, if I can, if I can sort of divide my answer into two points, which is the, the, the demand, the call, the support there is, which I recognise for greater coverage and you know what primary legislation is required for and what this particular piece of primary legislation is seeking to do. Within the original Freedom of Information Act, there is a power to allow, uh, by secondary legislation, the coverage of the Act to be extended. So we don't need to enact new primary legislation to give ministers that power. Now, the point I acknowledge that some people are frustrated that successive governments have not exercised that power, and there is a debate to be had in future about whether and to what extent we should in future exercise that power. And as I've said, I'm, I'm very open to that debate and I'll you know, listen very carefully to the views uh, that stakeholders um, are expressing. But we don't need to address that in, in this Act because we already have the primary legislative power. This Act um, is relatively narrowly drawn because it is looking to you know, tidy up some uh, aspects of the original Act and you know, in one uh, respect at least it is literally about tidying up the, the drafting to make it clearer and dealing with two uh, weaknesses that there are perceived to be um, in the Act. The one I've already spoken about around uh, the way in which you can reduce the, the lifetime of exemptions um, and secondly around the uh, whole area of prosecutions under the Act where because of the way our freedom of information regime works, you know, prosecutions were being rendered virtually impossible by the framing of the Act. So I I'm not, I'm, I'm not for any uh, by any stretch of the imagination saying I don't recognise the debate that people want to have about extension of coverage, but that is not a debate that hinges on or is uh, this Act, nor is it the case that we need to change primary legislation in order to have that debate or make progress in that direction. But there is also a concern about the people who are required to be consulted over the secondary legislation, uh, and that is that it is only the people who would be subject to freedom of information requests and not those people who might represent the interests of those who want to make the request. Now, that could be something which requires amendment within primary legislation, could it not? I, I don't think that's necessary. As a minister in my previous portfolio, I've always taken a very kind of open uh, approach to consultation. The, the, the legislative process, both in terms of primary legislation and secondary legislation, is, is laid down, um, and you know that's the process that Parliament goes through. With secondary legislation, um, committees... You know, have a role in, in that, and you know, committees, in, in my experience, are, are not shy at you know making their views heard on secondary as well as on primary legislation. But you know, I would be uh, very much of the view that, notwithstanding, you know, what the the strict interpretation of what has to be required in terms of secondary legislation might be, that if if we're having a debate about extending the coverage of freedom of information, that's a debate we would want to open up uh, to be as wide as possible. And you know, again, I. I'm happy to give a commitment that that's what we would seek to do. I'm sure it's something that we could have further discussion because we've had the offer of further amendments for this, uh, consideration at, second, uh, sure. well, well, at, the, at stage two from other organisations. Anyhow, can I also ask just a slightly different issue, and it was an issue in which the Information Commissioner didn't think it was necessarily to legislate, but we've all, some, several of us have expressed concerns about the way in which some sections of the public sector can prevaricate, obfuscate, make it difficult for people to get the information they ask. Now, the Information Commission didn't think this was as much a matter of legislation as uh, possibly guidance and so on. I just wondered, is this something which you will be returning to if you... Well, I, I'm happy always to, to look at... I mean, I you know go back to fairly recent experience I've had as, as Health Secretary and the Information Commission was our predecessor um, that issued uh, this particular uh, decision. But, you know, there was a, a decision that said NHS Ayrshire and Arran had not... Um, applied the principles and the letter of the law of freedom of information appropriately. And in my view, and I made this very clear publicly as health secretary at the time, that is completely unacceptable. You know, public bodies, public uh, agencies have that are covered by the Act have got an obligation to live up to the Act uh, in terms of the, the letter and the principle uh, of the Act. And, you know, as, as health secretary, um, I, you know, instructed Ayrshire and Arran to get its house in order and ensured that the learning from uh, what 
was not done properly in Ayrshire and Arran was then and is being applied across the wider NHS. So I, I think we should always challenge any public authority that is uh, seen to be or found to be not complying uh, with the principles uh, of freedom of information. Now, you will get... Uh, Many examples, you know, and, and this is in the nature of, of the thing where uh, a public body will have a particular interpretation of the provisions of the Act that will differ from the interpretation of the person seeking the information. And ultimately, of course, it's for the Commissioner to determine uh, what interpretation is, is correct and, and what is not, or even ultimately for the courts to do that. Um, but, you know, we, I think, in Scotland, not just the government, other parties and Scottish society generally are committed to the principles of openness and free access to information and public, abo public bodies should make sure they're abiding with that. OK, it's uh, John to be followed by Mark. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I, I mean, I know the, the points you've said because it's already been raised, the fact that uh, you do not consider, or the government does not consider that this is the opportunity to extend uh, the coverage of the Act. However, the, the very reality is we are having primary legislation again, which was what we had to start with with the Act. So I think there's an expectation out there, eh, or uh, people see the opportunity out there to extend it. And um, I mean, I wonder if you would accept that it's not just a question of extending it, because actually the information, I know you didn't want to go into maybe too many specific examples, but maybe I can, I can give some. I mean, if you take Glasgow, you know, it used to be that the housing was under the council, the car parks were under the council, the street wardens were under the council, the, uh, you know, a lot of things were under the council. The leisure centres, Kelvin Grove Art Gallery, were all under the council and would have been subject to freedom of information. They're now, now all outside the council and not subject to freedom of information. So far from actually keeping the thing the same, the amount of information that we can access or the public can access is actually reduced. I don't... I'm, I'm not challenging that view. I absolutely recognise that. I recognise that... Uh, for many reasons, not least as a, a constituency member of parliament in Glasgow who frequently has frustrations because of the outsourcing um, of services by the council and the implications of that in terms of, you know, ability to, you know, hold people to account, access information and, and respond to, you know, legitimate constituent queries. So I'm, I'm not disputing that. I, I'm saying, and I, I hope people are hearing me loudly and clearly as the new minister in charge of this, I'm very up for the debate about how we improve the public's access to information particularly where public money uh, and very often large amounts of public money um, are being spent. Um, I think we need to, in having that debate, we need to look at the extent to which improving that access to information requires formal uh, extension of the coverage of the Act, and there may well be uh, instances where that is the case, but there also may be different ways in which we can improve the public's access to that information. Now, as I said earlier on, I'm, I'm not saying I've got a fixed view on you know, which of these routes is best. It may be it's a combination of the two, but I'm, I'm signalling to you very clearly that I'm you know, up for having that debate, and I would hope the committee, as well as the others you've heard from this morning, will be a part of that. I mean, accepting that there's two separate things, there's what the bill is trying to do, and there's also a demand for more bodies to be included. And the two are, in fact, in many ways, not related. So, I mean, either the two could run in parallel as of now, uh, or, you know, the two could both appear in the bill. And I, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily sure that I have a pr particular oh. preference. But, I mean, couldn't we start very quickly the process of considering? Well, I'm, I'm happy to consider that. I mean, the, the commitment of the government and, you know, the decision the government took... Um, which is the standing decision of, of the government, was that we would begin that process uh, following the legislative scrutiny of this bill. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm not averse to going away and looking at that and seeing if there's some work we can start to do um, at the moment, if, if the committee's got an appetite for that. You know, that's, it is very much a separate issue to the slightly more technical issues that we're dealing with in this bill, and I think it's important that people see that the two are not one and the same. No, I mean, I'm just, I suppose then, on following in that logic, therefore, there's no particular reason why that one has to wait till the other one's complete, because there could presumably, an, it wouldn't be a problem if there was an overlap between the two. I suppose the other way of saying that is it's, you know, assuming yeah, Parliament agrees this bill, it's not going to be particularly uh, long until this bill is, is on the statute. But look, I'm, I'm happy to look at the timescales and the process around how we facilitate uh, the debate that uh, you're asking for. And, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm coming to this pretty open-minded. Um, there's a lot of factors have to be weighed up and balanced. It may be that, you know, there are things as we get into that debate that I'll take a different view to the committee or to some of the stakeholders on, um, but I'm perfectly open-minded 
uh, at this stage and I'm, I'm happy to look at more and come back to the committee on timescales and processes uh, that we might want to follow in that. Okay. Now, earlier on we mentioned uh, contracts and that maybe that was one way of getting openness uh, and I think in some cases that probably is the case. I suppose, again, I'm thinking in my Glasgow experience, uh, you know, my gut feeling is that Glasgow City Council paid over the odds for PFI secondary school contracts. Now, if that was the case, the council doesn't want that out in the open. The private sector doesn't want that out in the open. So, I mean, you, there you've got a contract where both parties want it secret, and yet we, the public, you know, want to see it. How can we tackle that? Well, as I said, I mean, there, it may well be that some of these things are best tackled by formally extending the coverage of the Act to include at least partially some of the commercial uh, organisations that are involved in these contracts, or it could be that for the future uh, we look at making specific some of the things that we would expect to be agreed in contracts that would allow the public access to some of this information. So, you know, there is a debate there to be had about the best way of allowing the public to access information that, as, as you're right to point out, in many, many cases is very much in the public interest. Yeah, and I think my final point would be, I mean, you've made the point, and your predecessors have made it as well, that uh, you know, the power is there already in the Act for ministers to, to act. But I, su I suppose for you know, some of the outside bodies, the crucial point for them is they actually don't want the power to be with the ministers. They want the power to be with the public. Would you see the distinction there? Well, as you know, ultimately, it has to be uh, Parliament that approves secondary legislation. Um, and so there has to be something in the, the legislation, as there is just now, that allows government to initiate the process that would result in the formal extension of the Act. I'm, I'm not sure how that would work in, in a different way in that formal sense. But where I would agree with you in terms of as we have the debate about the extent to which the Act might or might not be extended and the other things that could be looked at in terms of improving uh, the public's access to information, what the public want and the view of the public is extremely important in that and it's important that we, we garner that as, as part of the process. Mark, to be followed by Michael. Thank you very much, Convener, and can I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for coming along. I too was unaware of the freedom of information falling within the Cabinet Secretary's responsibilities. Uh, I recall it used to be the joke that John Swinney was the Cabinet Secretary for everything, and I think that mantle may now have been passed on. <laughs> so, um, he keeps it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I, I have made a note, Convener, to ask questions before Elaine Murray in future, because that's three times in a row that she's preempted most of the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, but if I could just ask one question to Cabinet Secretary, um, following on from the discussion that you had with Elaine Murray around the issues around Section 5, I think if I paraphrase the Information Commissioner correctly, she was talking about the notion that it shouldn't just be about bodies, but it should also be about looking at how we designate the delivery of public services um, in terms of looking at extension of the powers of the Act. Is that a, a view that you would have some sympathy with? I think that's, although I'm probably not articulating it the same way or even as well as the Information Commissioner will have done, I think that's the point I am making. I, I think in terms of the, the objective here, I guess, that people want to see is improving and extending the public's access to information. The mechanism about how you do that really depends to some extent on the kind of information the public want to access. Uh, and in some ways that will be about extending the Act, in other ways it will be looking at different mechanisms and, you know, given as the convener uh, and uh, John Mason have outlined, many public authorities are fundamentally changing the way they deliver public services, then that's got to be part of that discussion as well. Thank you. And I think given that you've made put on record your open-mindedness about many of the other issues, I think that the other questions I have have more or less been addressed by that convener. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark. Michael. Thanks very much, convener. Um, I'm mindful of the, the Freedom of Information Commissioner's um, guidance to us, if you like, not to get hung up on an argument around what the impact or change would be in relation to the absolute exemption for the royal family. But I, I have to say I found your argument a bit inconsistent and when the convener asked you to look at comparisons with Canada and other Commonwealth countries in their relationship uh, with the monarchy and their freedom of information legislation, you weren't prepared to comment. And yet in your defence, you cited the relationship between the freedom of information and the President of the Republic of Ireland in your defence. So why a comparison with that legislation there, but not a comparison with countries like yourselves who are part of the Commonwealth, and also to look at exactly what it is that we're trying to get, I think was what the uh, Information Commissioner was saying, 
is about the best legislation for Scotland in terms of addressing um, the, any issues that might come up in relation to that. And there's no evidence that could be provided by the Information Commissioner that we had a problem that needed to be addressed. So I, I, I'm looking for the consistency that you were arguing for in the answers that you've so far given, because I, I just don't see uh, how you can argue for consistency with the rest of the UK when their uh, change came about in a less robust way than we achieved our own freedom of information legislation. Our freedom of information legislation has been working well, given the evidence that we've had, and yet you're arguing that we should follow the lead uh, of Westminster, and I just find that inconsistent. I think that's a, a slightly kind of um, pejorative way to characterise what I'm saying, but anyway, I'll not go further down that road. I mean, I simply, I simply cited Ireland as a, a country where, you know, their head of state is completely exempt from freedom of information legislation, and you know that that's a fact. That's not what we are proposing here, and you know, I think that's a legitimate difference to to draw attention to. I. You know, I mean, I think everybody around this table knows uh, my kind of political uh, philosophy in terms of uh, Scotland's governance, but I do think it would be a slightly strange position to have, even if Scotland was independent, um, as I hope it will be in the not-too-distant future. It would be a slightly strange situation to have where the monarch's communications with the Prime Minister... Um, you know, the monarch obviously is constitutionally bound uh, to take the advice of our uh, government and to, you know, but, but is able to advise and to express views privately. If, if the communication there was treated differently to exactly the same kind of communication between the monarch and the First Minister of Scotland, I think that would be a kind of very, very difficult uh, and unusual position to have. And, you know, as, as I also said earlier on, this is not something that you know is likely to have massive impact you know i think i said there'd been two examples that we can find where the exemption for royal communications has ever been applied so this is you know something that is fairly limited in its uh, intent and li will be very limited in its impact and it's meant to avoid the kind of situation that i've described that i think would be you know kind of odd to say the least do you not concede, though, that what the concern is is not about the relationship between the Prime Minister, First Minister, the Prime Minister of Canada, or whatever? The issue is the principle of not having absolute exemptions in our freedom of information legislation. I mean, I've, I've already said I think absolute exemptions should be uh, something that are very, very rare and that we shouldn't do lightly. Um, and I, I would certainly take issue in terms of saying it's not about the relationship. If, if you had a situation where communications between the monarch and the prime minister were treated in freedom of information terms differently to communications between the monarch and the first minister, I think that does kind of go fundamentally to the nature um, of the relationships. I think the consistency is important, but I'm, I'm not arguing with the committee that absolute exemptions are something we should get into the habit um, of applying. They are, by their very nature, things that should only be applied where there is good reason, and I think in this case there is good reason. That said, I will you know, listen very carefully to uh, the evidence that's been given to the committee and to the uh, considerations that the committee itself makes in its stage one report, and if we consider in light of that that amendments at stage two um, are called for or appropriate, we certainly will be happy to consider that. Dave. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary. I must admit I've got a, a wee worry about the consistency argument because that would lead me to think that if Westminster changed the legislation in future to extend it beyond uh, the air and, and second in line to third, fourth or fifth in line, then we would be duty-bound to change our legislation again to follow uh, in on that. But that's not really what I want to, to ask you about. Um, it's to go back to the issue of broadening the scope of getting information, um, uh, freedom of information extended. And uh, the Procurement Reform Bill is actually going through Parliament just now. I'm not sure if that's one of your responsibilities. Or <laughs> it is, there we are. And I just wonder, therefore, then, that, you know, in light of comments about contracts being able to include freedom of information, 
um, and so on. Will the procurement reform bill, will the opportunity be taken to build something into that to ensure as much freedom of information yeah, as that's, possible? Yeah, that is something we are looking at in terms of the, the procurement reform bill. I'm, I'm assuming it will be this committee. I'll be back before too long, no doubt, talking about the procurement reform bill, and I think these are uh, discussions we'll have then. But, you know, it's, it's not just the uh, reform bill. If you look at initiatives like the, the Scottish Housing Charter, um, Public Records Act, um, and of course, the proposed uh, procurement reform bill. All you know have uh, all of these have the intention of promoting greater transparency and greater openness as a key objective, and it's certainly something that we'll seek to do uh, as far as we can through the procurement bill as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just just one other thing on the on the royal issue, because obviously it is a major part of the the, the kind of. The feedback that we've been getting on it. I mean, the, the, one of the concerns was that it was actually rushed through uh, the Westminster and that it wasn't necessarily a good piece of legislation. And we're just effectively accepting that legislation without um, proper scrutiny because it went through just before the 2010 Westminster election. It wasn't really effectively scrutinised. So is that not a concern that the look, Scottish I, Government has? I suppose one of the advantages of being new to a brief is it gives you the chance to look at things with a fresh eye. So I've, you know, I've given you what I think is a strong uh, reason for the change we're proposing here um, and I won't repeat that um, because you've, you've heard me say it already um, but you know I'm as I, as I always try to do with committees I'm I'm keen to hear the concerns and at further stages of the bill look to see whether there are ways we can you know address legitimate concerns that are raised so I'm you know more than happy to go away and uh, reflect on the points made um, and look at uh, whether there are amendments we could bring forward that would still retain uh, the objective that we're trying to achieve here because I do think the consistency arguments notwithstanding Dave Thompson's point are important but whether there's anything we can do to allay some of the concerns that have been expressed. Okay thank you. Now a lot of the issues in other parts of the bill we haven't really touched on so far and some of them have actually been covered in, in, in previous evidence sessions so I don't intend to repeat a lot of the questions that have been asked of, of, of other people who have uh, given evidence already today so I just want to finish with a couple of points actually just for your comment and one is about flexibility which hasn't come up since uh, in, in this particular uh, a session and uh, the, the ethical standards in public life have said that uh, the level of flexibility proposed will lead to a more complex and less accessible freedom of information system. I'm just wondering if you can comment uh, on that. I've not seen that particular comment, um, so I, I apologise if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm interpreting it wrongly. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily accept that's the case, although I will go and, and look carefully at what's been said. Um, I think one of the, particularly if you're looking at the reduction in the lifetime of the exemptions, I think one of the weaknesses in the Act just now is the inflexibility of it, where you know we could apply a blanket reduction in lifetime of an exemption, but we couldn't decide to apply different um, lifetimes for different categories of information. So. This act, this bill rather, is seeking to build more flexibility in there for what I think are very, very good reasons. Um, and I think I've, I've covered that point. If, if the point you were making is about something completely different, I'm happy to go away and look at it and come back to the committee in writing with a, an appropriate response. I, I think really the point that's been made is that if there are different kind of time periods for different kind of um, organisations, it, uh, um, it, it will make it more you will less user friendly and also for organizations it will make it perhaps more difficult for them to respond timidly to requests. I think in, I, I think we've got an, we've got a, a job of work to do in, in guidance or whatever that company to try and make sure that doesn't happen. But if I can flip that on its head, you know, while the government right now operates to a fifteen year uh, rule rather than a thirty year rule, if we were to insist that all other public authorities did that, we would have to insist that all of them did it, regardless of the kind of information that they hold or that none of them uh, did it, that we kept things the way they were. Now, given the fact that some public bodies will you know, hold information, I used the example of child protection, for example, where, frankly, it is appropriate to have a longer period that the exemption would apply to. So if we don't have this flexibility, all that will happen is that we don't make any changes that promote the earlier release of information. So this is actually about promoting earlier release of information where it is appropriate to do that. And if we don't take the flexibility that allows us to do that, then apart from what the government does, we'll be stuck with a 30-year uh, timescale for every other public authority and we won't get any uh, parts of, of that information potentially released on an earlier timescale. So I think that's a pretty good objective, but I take the point that in how we make how it's 
introduced and, and how it's explained, we need to make sure that the public understand it and that the user friendliness of the legislation isn't undermined. And just for completeness, because no one's raised it in any of the evidence sessions this morning, I just want to uh, ask you a bit about the refusal notice. We have um, conflicting evidence on this particular issue. For example, one, uh, the refusal notice, of course, um, being uh, allowing an authority to respond to requests by neither confirming nor denying whether information exists or is held. Um, if to reveal information exists or held would be against uh, the public interest. And uh, um, evidence we have received says, and I quote, one of the most important proposed amendments is that ability in itself is a protection of that personal data. But uh, a contradictory comment is that this amendment will adversely affect the right to access information from public authorities. Where do you think the balance is on that? I mean, do you, you know, in, in terms of amendment, I mean, uh, uh, what was the kind of thinking behind that, that particular amendment and how confident are you that it will actually do what it says on the tin? I think it's quite an important um, amendment that we're proposing here and I've, you know, obviously over the last few days as I've been preparing for this session I've looked at it quite carefully. As I understand it, it was actually the former Information Commissioner that recommended uh, this change in, in his special report. Um, I, as you know, uh, that uh, where information, currently where information falls within uh, certain exemptions, then the answer can be uh, neither to confirm nor deny that that information is held. But if the exemption uh, that has been used is because it's personal information, th that can happen. The, the, can, the answer can't be we don't confirm or deny. Now, the reason why I think it's important that that option is there is, for example, you know, say it was the police uh, being asked for information that impinged on personal data. Saying, even saying we have information in this person, we're applying the exemption, so we're not releasing the information, but saying they have information could alert somebody to the fact that they're under surveillance, for example, um, in connection with a criminal investigation. Um, mm -hmm. And as I understand it, it, you know, certainly elsewhere, uh, I'm not sure if this is the case in Scotland, it's police authorities that have been uh, certainly amongst the proponents of this change. Um, there will be other examples as well. So I think, you know, again, it's not an automatic, it, you know, the exemption would have to be applicable in terms of personal information, but I think it's important to have that option. And so I think we get the balance in this bill probably more right than the balance in the original Act was. Thank you. Now, that has exhausted questions from exhausted uh, the, me. the committee. <laughs> ah, away. You've only been here 45 minutes. Uh, I just wanted to know whether or not you had any further points you wished to make to no, the committee. No, I think to, just to reiterate the, the point I made that, you know, this bill's quite narrow in its scope, um, but that's not intended to, to suggest that there isn't a broader debate uh, out there. And, you know, I'm certainly up for that debate and, you know, looking forward to it. And I'm happy to engage further in due course over it. Well, thank you very much for your attendance and indeed that of your officials. And indeed, uh, that commits the, com that sorry completes the committee's oral evidence sessions on the bill today and indeed for stage one. I'd like to thank all the witnesses for their contributions, which will assist us in our scrutiny of the bill. Now, the committee agreed at its meeting last week to take the next item in private and we agreed at the beginning of this meeting to consider our approach to scrutiny of the draft budget 2013 14, which is also in private. I therefore uh, close the public part of this meeting and will suspend until 11.50 to allow witnesses and members of the public to leave and also for other witnesses to arrive.